Hello everyone. So this session I'm going to be talking about hormones and histamine. Now this is a really massive topic and really, really clinically relevant for most women. Okay, so what happens with histamine is that histamine will increase estrogen. Okay, and it does this as part of our natural biochemistry, it does this, it's when the histamine is too high that it does it in excessive amounts. It stimulates the ovaries to make estrogen. Okay, we obviously need that. But if histamine is too high, right, and this is where you have to ascertain why your histamine is too high, right, it will stimulate the ovaries to produce excess amount of estrogen. Now, the catch with all of this is that the way you detoxify estrogen through the liver and then through the gut will be compromised if you have histamine issues, okay? Because histamine is highly inflammatory and it often is coming from a disturbed gut microbiome. So if you have a disturbed gut microbiome, mainly SIBO or candida, yeast, oxalates, then it's likely that you're not detoxifying all that excess estrogen that you have, okay? And then what happens is the excess estrogen actually stimulates mast cells to produce more histamine, okay? Now, in younger women who have a regular monthly cycle, which is like 26 to 30 days, whatever, it's sort of regular for them, right? And if their progesterone is being produced and created in adequate amounts, right, then I really am looking for where is the histamine coming from, okay? Is it coming from simply an overload of histamine foods in the diet? It's very popular to do bone broths and fermented foods and kombucha and people are overdoing it. It could be that. It could be SIBO. It could be oxalates and yeast and candida. And it absolutely can be mold. So we definitely need to consider mold as a major cause of high histamine. Okay, so these women, these younger sort of younger girls, we need to think about why is it in a, in a, in a healthy cycle, right, a 28-day 20, a regular, regular cycle, why are they having huge symptoms of histamine at ovulation and before their period, okay? When women get older, right, um, Mandy, the mold testing is, is complicated, my colleague Melanie does the mold stuff. She's versed with that and can guide you on what testing you need to, need to do specifically because you can spend $10,000 doing mold testing. You need to know specifically what ones you need to do. Okay. Um, so getting back to... Um, okay, so I've got a question from Bianca. Um, is low level IgG result to gluten on food allergy test significant enough to cause? Look, look guys, gluten is highly inflammatory to all humans. We're all intolerant to it at some level, okay? It creates a lot of inflammation in our gut and will drive histamine in a, in a big way. That's just across the board, hands down. It's actually not good for human consumption, okay? So getting back to hormones and, and, and histamine, so when women get older and they do not ovulate as robustly as they used to when they were younger, and this is the perimenopause phase, and it, you know, it sort of starts around 40, it goes right through until menopause. What is happening is that the reduction in your pro production of progesterone will cause your estrogen to be relatively higher. And estrogen increases histamine. Okay, so it's very, very common for women in the perimenopause phase to start developing histamine symptoms for the first time. Okay, now this, is, this can simply be due to them having a hormonal imbalance. Okay, 
high estrogen, low progesterone. They might not necessarily have histamine being produced in the gut from SIBO or oxalates or candida. They might not have mold exposure. They might not be consuming a lot of high histamine foods. It's simply the imbalance in the hormones that can happen. Okay, so the key is to really question your patients around their cycle, their cycle length, consider their age, right? I mean, I mean women who are like in their early 20s and have a regular cycle, you know, they, they're going to have adequate amounts of progesterone most likely. So when women are getting older that they're not having adequate amounts of progesterone. So in the perimenopause phase, when women are getting hot flushes and night sweats and insomnia and anxiety, right? If you reduce the amount of histamine in their body, in their diet, it has a profound impact on those symptoms. In fact, most of the time it completely eliminates those symptoms. I've seen so many women with hot flushes and night sweats, when you remove the histamines and get the histamines down, that actually stops, okay? So we need to consider that how we buffer estrogen and make sure that our estrogen levels are um, not too high compared to progesterone is that we need to make healthy amounts of progesterone. Now, progesterone is made at ovulation, okay? So it is actually made when the follicle releases the egg. So the follicles grow and they, they grow inside the ovary and your dominant follicle, the healthiest follicle, releases the egg and the follicle then forms a tissue called the corpus luteum. And this tissue is so big, you can actually see it in a petri dish without a microscope. Okay, so we need to make this, this corpus luteum. Okay, now the corpus luteum will secrete progesterone. Okay, I've just got a question. Is adding Prometrium option if progesterone is low? Yes, Prometrium is brilliant because Prometrium is the type of progesterone that crosses the blood brain barrier. Okay, and that will help produce GABA, which is your calming neurotransmitter. So that just helps with sleep and everything. And it also helps buffer the excess estrogen that you would have because of low progesterone. Okay, so getting back to making your own progesterone. Okay, so healthy ovulation will make a healthy corpus luteum and the corpus luteum secretes progesterone. So how do you have healthy ovulation? You need to have low inflammation and low oxidative stress. Histamine is very inflammatory. So you need to ascertain why you've got high histamine in the first place. Okay, and I've, I've gone on, on about that many, many times, okay? So once you ovulate and you've got your corpus luteum, there are certain nutrients that you need to make progesterone, okay? You absolutely need iron. You need zinc, you need B6, you need selenium, you need vitamin D, and you need iodine, okay? So if you, you probably got, need to go and test for a lot of those nutrients. You should definitely test for iron. You can test for zinc. You can test for iodine and vitamin D, okay? If you just simply take a good activated B vitamin, you'll get enough vitamin B6, okay? So if you have those nutrients in place, it can really, really help with progesterone production. Um, so Bianca's got a question. Is migraine and ovulation and five days before period sound like estrogen withdrawal or histamine? Okay, so. At ovulation, your estrogen is at its highest point, okay? So estrogen increases histamine in the brain, okay? So you need to consider that it's high estrogen at ovulation, okay? Then what can happen five days before your period is that if your corpus luteum, which is secreting progesterone is not healthy and it's not secreting enough progesterone or you don't have the nutrients in place to make progesterone or simply you're just getting old like you're really pushing into the sort of late menopause perimenopause 48 49 50 then 
it's the reduction in progesterone compared to estrogen okay so if it's it's the thing with migraines and hormones it's hard to treat because of the cyclical nature of the rise and fall in hormones and until you go through menopause you're always going to be on that roller coaster we just try to make the, the ride easier um, so Nikki says if you have MTHFR and can't tolerate a lot of supplements what's the options so MTHFR is not a diagnosis of anything it does not mean you can tolerate supplements or you can't okay if you can't tolerate supplements it's got to do with another issue nothing to do with MTHFR okay it can have a lot to do with the gut microbiome and your digestive enzyme capacity particularly bile acids so if bile acids are not in place if you don't have healthy liver function healthy gallbladder and bile acid production if you don't have healthy pancreatic enzymes if you've got SIBO if you've got low hydrochloric acid then it's likely that you can't tolerate a lot of supplements also particularly B vitamins, if your histamines are really high and you go in and take B vitamins, they break down histamine, but you're breaking down the histamine without treating the cause. Okay, so it can come out in a worsening of your symptoms. Okay, so guys, MTHFR is not a diagnosis of anything, right? You've got to get that out of your head, right? It is simply one gene and one enzyme in the body. All that enzyme does is donate a methyl group to folate. Okay, now if you have SIBO, then you're not absorbing your folate properly. Okay, you, it, it, it doesn't mean that it causes anything on its own. Okay, it's not a diagnosis of anything on its own. You need to look at all the, um, the entire methylation pathway. Oh, Nikki, yes, I can't tolerate bees and have candida and SIBO. Nikki, that's right. You, you don't need to take bees. You need to fix SIBO and get candida down. And if you've got candida, you need to consider the oxalates, okay? So I've written a lot about that in my book on oxalates, it's, it's complex oxalates, but you will have huge, uh, huge histamine issues from both of those things. Um, Bianca, will we know if we take hydrochloric acid and we don't need it? Will heartburn get worse? Yes. So. The thing with hydrochloric acid, Bianca, is like no one is no one is really high hydrochloric acid on their own. It's coming from histamine. So, if you have a lot of hist a lot of SIBO and histamine being being produced, you can it can all click on with stomach problems in the stomach, like Helicobacter pylori. You're producing a lot of hydrochloric acid because of the high histamine. Right, but you're often producing it at the wrong time, like after the meal or in the middle of the night or in the morning, okay? So, and that can cause heartburn and can damage the esophagus. It's actually quite dangerous. So, the, the, you, you've got to think about why you have those issues. And part of the reason you have those issues in the first place, i.e. the SIBO, is because you might have low hydrochloric acid in the first place, okay? So, you, you need to get the histamines down and you, then you can take hydrochloric acid. Be very careful if you've had Helicobacter pylori or a stomach ulcer because it can burn the stomach, which is very, very unpleasant. Okay, so you, you, you gotta be careful, you gotta be very careful with hydrochloric acid. Um, okay, so I just wanna talk more about that, like perimenopause, okay? So, you know, my, what you're going to understand with perimenopause is you're just not going to be producing amazing progesterone like you, like you did when you were younger. Um, and because of that, just reducing your histamine load in your diet is going to help you, right? So don't go eating heaps of fermented foods and heaps of alcohol and heaps of like soy sauce, fish sauce, drink kombucha every day, have bone broth. It just is not going to help any woman in that perimenopause phase, okay? So I'm 46, if I go out for Japanese food, I'll be mindful of how much histamine I have. So for instance, I won't have a miso soup so that I can have a, one glass of wine, okay? So if I have a glass of wine and a miso soup and teriyaki and I have soy sauce and fish sauce and all that stuff, then my histamines will be through the roof and I'm not even a high histamine person. 
Um, where can you get my book? Um, Randy, you can buy it via my website. If you jump on my website, which is joannekennedy.com.au, you would be able to buy it there. Um, okay, so um, I have bad heartburn and suspect histamine issues stemming from low hydrochloric acid. Um, well, that's right, Bianca, but you can't, you can't take like, hydrochloric acid until you deal with what can be causing the heartburn. If it's coming from histamine, it will be coming from SIBO and or Helicobacter pylori. Okay, so if you haven't been tested for Helicobacter pylori, you should go to your doctor and get tested for that. You need to take the triple therapy for that. Natural medicine really is not very efficacious for treating Helicobacter pylori. Okay, um, all right, so going back to perimenopause, right? So if, you know, if you are having lots of histamine issues and, and you know, like, and you've tried, you just, you just get your histamine low down with your diet, you try and make as much progesterone as you like, and you're still having bad symptoms, then I always, always would be looking at the gut microbiome in these ladies, like the um, candida or SIBO, as well as um, exposure to mold. Okay, so it's very simple just to remove the very high histamine foods from your diet, make sure you're making adequate progesterone, and if that helps, fantastic. If it doesn't, then there's an underlying histamine issue that you've had for a long time, but because your hormones have been more balanced because you've been younger, it hasn't shown up as hormonal symptoms yet. Um, um, is there a low dose antihistamine um, less than Zyrtec? Um, look, the best antihistamine, Sarah, the best antihistamine you can take is the Dow enzyme. You can buy that. It's called Histamine Block. Seeking Health make Histamine Block. You can buy that online. And there are other Dow enzyme supplements. You need to make so sure it's a porcine derived Dow enzyme. Um, and, the, and, and you can take that because that is breaking the histamine down at, at, with the Dow enzyme, right? You, you, if you're breaking it down with the enzyme designed to break it down, you shouldn't have to take antihistamines. Um, okay, so what about in actual menopause when, you're, when you've stopped menstruating? So... You know, a lot of women will say, oh, I'm not going to take estrogen, I'm not going to take bioidentical hormones. And let me tell you that when the time comes and you are, sorry, the brand, um, Sarah, the brand is Seeking Health and it's called Histamine Block. Okay, so when the time comes and you're in menopause and you're sweating profusely and you're depressed and you've got a dry vagina that's giving you urinary tract infections and you've got insomnia, right? Then taking bioidentical estrogen can save your life and make you feel amazing. However, if your histamine bucket is full up with SIBO, candida, mold, whatever, when you take bioidentical estrogen, what can happen, it can shoot your histamine load through the roof. And then, yes, you might not be so depressed and you might, your libido might come back a bit. However, you're itchy, you've got migraines, you're still not sleeping, even though your, your estrogen's fixed, but your histamines are through the roof. Okay, so if you're a woman that has taken estrogen and had histamine symptoms, you need to consider what is causing your body to be already too high in um in histamine okay so really really important when with all, all women perimenopause menopause you need to understand histamine and you need to get a grip on your histamine bucket if you've got histamine issues and where they're coming from um, okay so I want to talk to you now about estrogen detoxification so there is three main pathways in the liver that detoxify estrogen. One is methylation, the other is sulfation, and the other is glucuronidation. Okay, now, when you support these pathways in the liver, they help bind up your estrogen ready for passage through the bowel. Okay, so 
what you need to support methylation is you need to be correcting your methylation you need to understand what your homocysteine levels are and you need to ensure that you're methylating well okay taking activated b vitamins is a good place to start but it's not the only thing i'll talk more about methylation later i do talk a lot about it in my book okay now the other pathway is sulfation now methylation issues will impact sulfur issues and you need sulfur for sulfation okay so you need to start with methylation think about that and then understand how methylation drives issues with sulfation okay and then the glucuronidation pathway now the glucuronidation pathway is one that um we can have a you know there's actually an interesting test that is um just in your in your in your bloods in a standard blood test from the doctor you'll get bilirubin and bilirubin is broken down via the glucuronidation pathway. If you have high bilirubin, then there's issues with the glucuronidation pathway and issues with estrogen detoxification via that pathway. Okay, and the supplement you take for um, the glucuronidation pathway is calcium deglucurate. Okay, and there's another thing that calcium deglucurate does, which I'll chat to you about in a minute. Okay, so they are the liver detoxification pathways. Now, you what i've got a question can you talk about the difference between over and under methylation okay so katrina that's a really simplified way of looking at methylation okay so you don't we don't that's a really old way of looking at it we don't need to think about over and under and what was what the fifa protocol would talk about this is an old sort of school protocol would say you are over methylating if you have low histamine in the blood and you are under methylating if you have high histamine in the blood that's because methylation breaks down histamine however the main reason you're going to have high histamine in your blood is or low is because of gut issues right because the histamine is getting into the bloodstream okay so it can be high because you've got SIBO, you've got mold, you've got candida, right? It's high and it's nothing to do with you being a undermethylator and, and vice versa, okay? So methylation is, you know, it's something, it's, 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 it's an essential part of our biochemistry that we need to consider when treating someone as a whole, okay? So what will cause your methylation to be sluggish right um, is issues with the absorption of nutrients and the lack of intake of nutrients that you need for methylation now the big thing with methylation is that it needs the amino acid methionine okay now methionine is high in animal protein eggs okay sorry like vegetarians it's just you just don't get the amount of methionine you need from a plant-based diet so when you eat animal protein and you break it down properly with hydrochloric acid and you absorb it your methionine will create SAME s adenosyl methionine the body's major methyl donor okay so what then happens once SAMI goes around the body and donates the methyl groups, it gets deactivated and it will create SAR. Now SAR then goes on to create homocysteine and then homocysteine needs to move around the methylation cycle to create more methionine. Okay, and it does that with the use of um, B12, which again, you need animal protein and hydrochloric acid and you need methylfolate. So you need to be eating folate rich foods, you need to be absorbing them so that the MTHFR gene can donate a methyl group to folate to create methylfolate. And that cycle goes round and round and round. Okay, now methylation breaks down histamine in the central nervous system and it detoxifies estrogen. So it's very, very important for hormonal histamine estrogen issues. Okay, now one of the best places to start with looking at methylation is test your homocysteine because if homocysteine is low it means that you have massive issues with um, the sulfation pathway 
or you're not absorbing your protein and your methionine is not high enough to methylate and create SAM, which will then create homocysteine. Okay, so it's complicated, guys, but it's just, it's, um, you know, you need to be considering the environment, the gut, and the absorption of nutrients that you need for methylation. You can't just throw methyl supplements at the situation and expect it to work. It often makes people um, wait um, worse. Okay, um, so going back to um, detoxification. So once all these pathways are supported, okay, they like methylation, gluconidation, sulfation, and th what they do is they package up estrogen and it goes down to the bowel, okay? And in the bowel, what will happen, simply if you don't poop every day, you're not gonna get rid of that estrogen. Or if you have an unhealthy microbiome, what can happen is you can produce too much of an enzyme called the beta glucuronidase enzyme. That enzyme deconjugates estrogen, it breaks it. So the liver's done this amazing job to package your estrogen, and then this enzyme breaks it. Therefore, you have more active estrogen. So more estrogen being recycling back to the liver. Okay, so estrogen dominance and more histamine because estrogen increases histamine. Okay, so we need to be looking at liver, but gut is super, super important. Um, Bianca, yes, yes, you can test homocysteine with a blood test. It's a simple blood test. It's fasting, an overnight fast, um, and it, the doctors will do that. Okay, if it's low, right, and you do eat like good amounts of animal protein, if it's low, it's, I reckon it's mold. Right, the more patients I see with low homocysteine, it's mold because mold is contains oxalate, and oxalates cause havoc with the pathway called the sulfation pathway that homocysteine sort of um, moves moves into. Okay, so testing um, homocysteine is really important. Um, okay, guys, so I'm going to wrap up. I just want to talk to you a little bit more about some. Um, estrogen detoxification supplements, okay? So support methylation, B vitamins, supports the sulfation pathway. Test your homocysteine as a start because if there's low homocysteine, you have big issues with that pathway that need to be corrected. If you don't, simply taking some N-acetylcysteine, which is some sulfur, can help with sulfation. Um, and then the gluconidation pathway is calcium to glucrate. Now, um, now, the thing with the gut microbiome, you gotta fix it, but what can also help reduce the beta glucuronidase enzyme is calcium deglucrate. So that works on the liver and the gut. So if you've ever worked with me, you know that I'm big on calcium deglucrate. Um, you need to test your iodine. Okay, so iodine helps support ovulation and helps make progesterone. Okay, so it's gonna really, really help um, sort of um, reduce estrogen dominance and it also desensitizes estrogen receptors. That's really, really helpful. You need to test your vitamin D. Okay, so vitamin D is going to support the production of progesterone. You want your vitamin D to get up at around 100. Okay. Um, Bianca, mold made my homocysteine crash very quickly. Yep. Yeah. Guys, mold, I see it all the time now. Like, I'm just so good at picking it up. If you have chronic gut issues that you've treated SIBO, you've done candida protocols, and you've still got chronic gut issues and chronic food intolerances, you've got to think about mold. If your homocysteine is low, you've got to think about mold. If your histamine bucket is super high, you have to think about mold. Okay, the thing with mold is it completely disrupts your estrogen metabolism and it disrupts your bile acids. Okay, and if you've got sluggish bile, you're gonna have massive issues with hormone detoxification, and you're gonna have massive issues with SIBO. Okay, so you really, really need to get mold checked out. And my colleague, Melanie, is amazing at treating mold if anyone needs help with that. Um, okay, all right guys, so that's enough. I'm gonna, this will now go on my feed. Um, so Katrina, what about chronic candida? Well, chronic candida is gonna be an oxalate issue. Candida is a yeast, a fungus, and it contains oxalate. Okay, so oxalates cause havoc to the gut, they damage it, they deplete your iron and your zinc and B6, and they also cause havoc with sulfur. So 
Candida, sorry, oxalates share the same transport carrier as sulfur. And what happens is your oxalates are high, the oxalates hog the transport train. And what happens is you start dumping sulfur in the urine. Okay, I've got to get a drink, hang on a sec. When you dump sulfur in the urine, what happens is your body is desperate for sulfur and it will start chopping up homocysteine to get sulfur because homocysteine is a storage molecule for sulfur. Okay, now when things get really bad, your body can actually start chopping up glutathione, your body's major antioxidant, to get more sulfur and then you become depleting glutathione. Okay, um, so the thing with a reduction in sulfur is that you, you can't get on top of your chronic inflammation because you can't make enough glutathione. And glutathione sequesters all the free radicals that occur with chronic inflammation. Okay, so candida, you need, if, you have, if you're being treated for candida, you need to get a, a practitioner that understands oxalates. Okay, all right guys, thank you for joining me. I will repost this on my feed, the recording of it. So if you want to listen to it again, you can. Thank you.